slide number three. The Babylon virus. The Babylon virus. Luke 18, 18 to 30, gives us a very clear example of the people of the world and how they live. Luke 18, 18 to 30. <clears throat> Excuse me. A teacher asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Him, of course, being Jesus. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good but one, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your mother and father. I I've kept all these from my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. Seeing that he became sad, Jesus said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, then who can be saved? He replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Then Peter said, look, we have left what we had and followed you. So he said to them, I assure you, there is no one who has left a house, wife, or brothers parents or children because of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more at this time and the eternal life in the age to come. Mark also covers this and in Mark's gospel verses 29 to 31 of chapter 10 say, I assure you there is not one who has left house, brothers or sisters, mother or father, children or fields because of me and the gospel who will not receive 100 times more. Now at this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So even though the, the, the Gospels are parallel, okay, here, Mark has a more detailed breakdown of that second statement than Luke does. But the point is the same. If you are infected with the virus of mammonitis, okay? Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon, right? And we're going to read that. You, you become a slave to one or the other. So if you're a slave to mammon, a slave to things and stuff and money and acquisition and materialism, you, you can't be a slave to God. They run counter to one another. They are idealistically just opposed against one another. And so even though this young man did all the stuff, even though he had all of the works correct where his heart was was where his treasure was you know it's kind of interesting that uh, just when we read that I wondered if he had said okay and did that you know what would have been what would have happened he would, know, he would have been like one of the disciples you know would it have been a situation you know, where he would have given up everything, but he really would not have, you know, I don't know, maybe just maybe that's worldly thinking to think that he, he might not have lost everything and that things might Well, that's what been. Jesus said. No one who's left house, brothers, sisters, yeah. mothers, or fathers, children, or fields because of me and the gospel will not receive a hundred times more. Now at this time and with eternal life coming. So, that you know, when Peter says, we've left everything to follow you. But you know what's <clears throat> I don't see that, or maybe I'm missing it. I don't see that with the disciples because we see a lot of, we see a lot of difficulty. You know, I don't I don't know if, we're, if it's just not in Scripture, but we don't, I don't know if we're, see, if we're seeing the other things. I know that their needs were met. I know that they were able, they, they just didn't lack anything. Um, 
maybe that's not. The only time we see any kind of need that the disciples have or that their families have is when Jesus heals Peter's mother. So the implication is that their business is continued. That's their families continued, right? right? Later on, Paul talks about that Peter was taking his wife with him into ministry. Oh, yeah. And that when they visited places, you know, Peter's wife went with him. Oh, okay. it, you know, so it, it's true. Everywhere they went, people accommodated them. People took them in. And that's why Jesus would say things like, you know, when you go in, extend your peace. And if your peace is not returned to you, leave. Implication being that there are going to be people everywhere that are going to, because of the message, because of the gospel, receive you and provide for your needs. Right? Paul talks about the fact that he could have accepted these things, but he chose not to. Okay? So Paul would work wherever he went, but because of the sake, for the sake of the gospel, Paul could have gone anywhere and people would have taken care of him. You know, they would have provided for his needs, etc., etc. We are so infected, I think, with this disease of materialism ourselves. But that we can't see it. And maybe that yes. was this this man's issue that he just he couldn't see it. He right. could do all the things. Right. And it's tangible. Yesterday a, a young lady on the job, I don't know, we just 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 talking, and she was saying she made a comment, you know, that people really don't need to have anybody. And I and it was funny because my my first response to that I said, well, that's stupid. How can anybody live without somebody? I mean, even if it's somebody that we don't know, we still have to live. We need people. Mm -hmm. And I said that's impossible for people to think that they can live without people. Most of the time, people who have some maybe what we would call quality of life is because they have people yes. you know, around them. Yeah, people. well, studies show that married men live longer than single men do. I mean, no, seriously. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, that, that... But that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and so I thought, I was like, wow. And she's in her 20s. And I'm thinking, I said, no, honey. But that that's the worldview that is so prevalent today, right? The Invictus prayer is people's mantra. I'm the captain of the ship. I'm the master of my own fate. I, I am, I am, I am. And it's all about me and not about God. They're, they are thoroughly infected. Well, I know. I see that a lot. It's, I see that a lot. And it's, and it's, but I guess I just want to, you know, it's, it seems like the, that, that view is so, uh, it's in a bubble. And it's like, can you burst it? P please burst it and realize that there's a huge world out here. Only God can do that. And you can't live like that. Who can be saved? With God, with, with man, it's not possible. But with God, it is possible. That, that's, that's what happened. The, the disciples watched this very rich guy who they probably were a little bit envious of. Because yeah, the dude had a whole bunch of stuff. Plus, he was doing it. It looked like he was doing it right. Yeah. And I think that's most, that, that, not most, that's a lot of Christians' conundrum. Yes, you know, Because I'm lacking, I'm working paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, maybe I made some bad choices. Yeah, you know, whatever. It's got me to this point, but I'm but I'm here, and here it is. You know, somebody else who looks like they're just doing so well, and they're not all <laughs> right. You know, that's right. Yeah, you 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 jumped ahead too. Sorry. No, it's okay. I, it's just it's good to know when those things happen that that what we're talking about is in that. You know what I mean? That that where we're going is in the vein of that conversation. You know. I move to slide number three, Mammonitis, the Babylon virus. And as you can see, I put Smeagol and Gollum. And I have to say that was not original. Um, Dr. Azurdia borrowed it, and it, he, he actually came up with this, and I said this is a brilliant thing. We look at Smeagol early on when he first gets the ring, mm -hmm. and he's in the early stages of Mammonitis. The ring is everything. It has started to take him over, right? By the end, look at him. Yeah. By the end, look at him. Look at what the pursuit of and the mindless dedication to materialism and the possession of things does to you. 
materialism is in many ways the ultimate idolatry because it promises self-sufficiency, self-determination, abundant, contented, unfettered living apart from and without the need for God. We look at these people who get a lot of money and, and they, they just... But what if I do this and I still know that I need God? Well, does the Bible say that money is evil? No. no. It says the love of. And that's something we're going to talk about in a little while. What, what does it mean to love money? That's what's evil. And so what happens is people, you know, well, let's read Luke 16, 12 to 15. And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, Luke 16, 12 to 15. And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what is your own? No household slave can be the slave of two masters, since he will either hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't be slaves to both God and money. What's the implication here? That if you belong to God, you are his slave. You can't be a slave to both God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and scoffing at him. Of course they were. Because they put their heart where their treasure was. And they put their treasure where their hearts were, right? He told them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly admired by people is revolting in God's sight. What is highly admired of people, by people, is revolting in God's sight. What is highly admired of people? The appearance of wealth. Right? The appearance of material success. Psalm 20, verses 6 to 8. Now I know that the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories from his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and others in horses, but we take pride in the name of Yahweh our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand firm. Psalm 37 verses 3 to 6. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Now, is that a promise of material wealth? No. It says, though, that if you delight yourself in the Lord, you'll receive the desires of your heart. Does that mean that you will receive the desires of your heart in its current state? No. It means that if God is your delight, okay, created me a new heart, a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me, right? If, if God is the desire of your heart, then he will give you what your heart's desire. We're going to look at how that has to do with Romans 12, 1 and 2 in a little while. That has been so, and that's been so misused. Yes, because we, we're appealing to people's lust and greed. Or, or their needs. Or their needs. Or their needs. Yes. Yes. Next slide. We actually looked at this a year ago in the beginning stages of our study. This is from our October 12th, 2014 study. And it was timely and it was right on, it was poignant. So I was like, let's put this up again. Thinking rightly about God. I mean, delight yourself in the Lord, you will receive the desires of your heart. Well, we have to think rightly about God. Steve, would you? Sure. 
<clears throat> what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion and that man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry, for idolatry is at bottom a libel on his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is, in itself a monstrous sin, and substitutes for the true God one made after its own likeness. Let us beware lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration and that civilized peoples are therefore freer from it. <clears throat> the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. It begins in the mind and may be present where no overt act of worship has taken place. Wrong ideas about God are not only the fountain from which the polluted waters of idolatry flow, they are themselves idolatrous. The idolater simply imagines things about God and acts as if they were true. Before the Christian church goes into eclipse anywhere, there must first be a corrupting of her simple basic theology. She simply gets a wrong answer to the question, what is God like? and goes on from there. The masses of her adherents come to believe that God is different from what he actually is, and that is heresy of the most insidious and deadly kind. A.W. Tozer from his book, The Knowledge of the Hope. Bruh. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's, it, it gets you in the gut, man. That last paragraph in particular, I mean, the whole thing, but that last paragraph about how it's, it's so simple, just a simple wrong answer. What is God like? I mean, it is, it is so reminiscent of the first temptation in the garden, right? Mm. The, the first thing we see Satan say in the Bible Right? Did God really say? Questioning the character, questioning the identity, questioning God. And then idolatry comes right along on its heels. Because the minute you get that wrong, the minute you get that wrong, worshiping God anymore. That's right. That's right. And it's so subtle, you don't know when it happens. The next thing you know, you're someplace you never planned to be. And that is a perfect segue into our next slide, the infection in the church. The reason that the tithe lie works is because people are infected. Greed and fear offered in tandem like two sides of a coin, using a misrepresented, eisegeted portion of Malachi chapter 3 are very powerful motivators. People normally just look at Malachi 3, 8 to 10, and they focus right there, and they grab those three verses out. But look at the verses that wrap around it. Verses, let's start at verse 7, Malachi 3, verse 7. Since the days of your fathers you have turned from my statutes, you have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. That immediately should make you go, who, who's talking here, and who's he talking to? 
right? But you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? You ask, how do we rob you? By not making the payment of the tenth and the contributions. You are suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, is still robbing me. He's talking about a nation that's under a curse. Well, could that, could that be us? Then why are we applying it to us? Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Listen to verse 11. I'll rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land or the vine of your field will not fail to produce fruit. Well, well wait, what? Hmm. Verse 12, then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Probably not about tithing money in the church. Probably not about tithing money in the church. But because we are saying this thing to people who are infected with mammonitis, the Babylon virus, material coveting, we tell them that they're robbing God and they're under a curse, and we, we, we access the fear button, and we keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Well, what's the antidote? Give. Well, then we access the greed button. Give, and you're going to get a blessing. So much so, it's without measure. So if I go to church and I throw my coins or my dollars into the collection plate, and I pull the lever, I'm supposed to win the jackpot every time. So it's saying that even though you do these things, you're still robbing them. No, you don't do them. You don't do them. That's what he's he's saying to Israel that they are robbing him, that they are that they are away from him. They, you've turned away from my statutes. Mm -hmm. You haven't kept them. Come back. So this, I'm confused about this next. Will a man rob God that you are robbing me? Mm -hmm. You ask, how do you rob you? By not making the payments of the ten and the ten. And the That's ten. how you're robbing me. By not making the payments. You're supposed to tie Israel, and you're not. Remember what the tithe was for in Israel, right? The Levites, the sons of Aaron, they were in the temple all the time. Their job was to minister to God. So they couldn't own property. They couldn't own land. And so the other tribes were supposed to support them. By bringing what? Foodstuffs in so that they could eat. And they weren't doing that. Because everybody was doing their own thing. It has nothing to do with us at all. In the same way that Jeremiah 29, 11 doesn't have anything to do with us at all either, but that's a whole other thing. This is not even an example that we could use. No, it's not. This particular passage of Scripture has no significance for the quote-unquote church today, except to show us how God deals with his people and how he dealt with them in that particular time. This is not an object or a pattern or principle for us. There is enough scripture on giving in the New Testament that makes it clear how we're supposed to give. There's no temple. The temple was torn down in 70 AD. So what priests are there to support? The reality is that we are the priests and our body is the temple. So if you're going to tie it, tie it to yourself. Hmm. Right? Okay? I'm preaching good, as A.R. Bernard would say. All right. The reason that the prosperity gospel works is the same reason that the lottery works. 
and all forms of gambling work. People, blinded by their desires, want to believe that they deserve better. So they'll do whatever they can to make their dreams come true. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And with its veneer of godliness, the prosperity gospel also uses the enticement of entitlement to double or to compound the infection by claiming that material wealth is somehow a right, a proof, an ordered result of a certain lifestyle or a set of practices. If you take one step, God will take two. Mm. Won't he do it? Right? All of those things that are telling us how we're supposed to do it in order to get a blessing. The next two slides are an article by David Jones. They're not really there for us to read during service. They're more so there for you and your study time if you want to get an idea of, you know, it's a good article on um, what the prosperity gospel is and what the, what the flaws with it are. Okay? Uh -huh. That's more, more what it's about. So I'm not going to read them. I just want to <clears throat> just touch on a couple of scriptures, okay? The prosperity gospel is turning believers into the enemies of the cross of Christ, says a Facebook friend of mine, gospel artist Kenny Corey from Africa. And then he uses the following scripture. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, Philippians 3.18. The Bible says, Proverbs 15, 16, it's better to have little with fear of the Lord than to have great treasures and inner turmoil. Now, why would you have inner turmoil if you had great treasures? You're constantly worried about your stuff. And then it's not about stuff. It's about what's going on in your heart. It doesn't matter. You can have, the, you can have a mansion and it will be, be empty and lonely. Remember that commercial where the guy's like, I have a fantastic house. Mm -hmm. I have this. Look at my brand new lawnmower. I have this and that. And then at the end of the commercial, he's like, and I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. Somebody help me. Yeah, I remember that. Or like the, um, who's the, the New York uh, heiress who died and she left all her money to a cat? Um, Helmsley. Just even to a cat or a dog? either one and you know it just popped into my head and thinking to myself you don't have any people you could have left money to there were no significant others in your life that you could have left money to no. there was no organizations that you love and care about that you could have left money to nope. when Howard Hughes was the first person I had heard about that kind of stuff from in our childhood. How, you know, the state he was in when he died, which was very much like how the Bible describes um, Nebuchadnezzar. With his nails long and his hair long, unkempt, living like an animal. I don't know if you guys can remember that. Oh, yeah, he's so much younger than me, yes. But when Howard Hughes died, I mean, remember, there was a drawing of him curled up in a corner with all this long, scraggly hair and these long, filthy fingernails and, and all of that because, you know, he, he became like Nebuchadnezzar. Which is really sad. Um... Godliness with contentment is great gain, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Better is a single day in your courtyard than a thousand days anywhere else. I would prefer to stand outside the entrance of my God's house than live comfortably in the tents of the wicked, Psalm 84, verse 10. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts 
are sent on pilgrimage. Psalm 84, verse 5. See the mindset of somebody who's not infected? I would rather have nothing and be outside God's house than live in luxury in Babylon. Yes. They see the value. That's right. <clears throat> okay. You know what? Let's just read the five points that he's making here, not necessarily the entire thing. He says, and this is David W. Jones, professor of Christian ethics and associate dean for graduate program administration and director of the Masters of Theology program at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. That's a lot, right? He says five errors of the prosperity gospel. Number one, the Abrahamic covenant is a means to material entitlement. That's one of the things that they teach. Number two, Jesus' atonement attends to the, extends to the sin of material prosperity. Po excuse me, material poverty. Right? Because remember, poverty is a curse. You're under a curse. Right? Number three, so Jesus died to, Jesus died to free you from the curse of poverty. And I've heard that. Number three, Christians give in order to gain material compensation from God. Number four, faith is a self-generated spiritual force that leads to prosperity. What? You ever heard Copeland talk about the force of faith? And, and Creflo talking about you got to use the force of faith. You know, it, it's like you, you almost wait for young master Jedi. Use the force. If I can do that, just stand in front of the bank and use the force of faith. Why would we even do that? Do the, use the force of faith and save money pile up right here in my living room. Right, right, like Leroy Thompson. Money cometh to, to me money. now. Save my bank account. That's what I'm saying. I would go hold my hand over my computer and do a spiritual wealth transfer from the banks of the world into my bank account. I mean, seriously. Number five, prayer is a tool to force God to grant prosperity. How many times have we heard that? So these are things that people are being taught. And they appeal to their already infected brains. They're already infected souls. They're already infected hearts. And instead of preaching holiness unto the Lord and righteousness, we are preaching God can't do anything in the earth realm without your permission. And if you do this, God is obligated to do that. And all these other things that we are telling people that leave people in a state of devastation and despair because they are lies. Next slide, the warning and the antidote. Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Now the Lord says this, think carefully about your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to become drunk. You put on clothes, but you never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. All the sought after creature comforts, you're not getting them. Think carefully about your ways. Look at what's going on in your life and examine your ways. Micah chapter 6, verses 9 to 15. The voice of Yahweh calls out to the city, and it is wise to fear your name. Pay attention to the rod and the one who ordained it. Are there still the treasures of wickedness and the accursed short measure in the house of the wicked? Can I excuse wicked scales or bags of deceptive weights? For the wealthy of the city are full of violence, and its residents speak lies. The tongues in their mouths are deceitful. As a result, I've begun to strike you severely, bringing desolation because of your sins. 
you will eat, but will not be satisfied. For there will be hunger within you. What you acquire you cannot save, and what you do save I will give to the sword. You will sow but not reap. You will press olives but not anoint yourself with oil. And you will tread grapes but not drink the wine. In other words, the very work, the fruit of your hands, the work that you do will be pointless. Revelation 18 verse 20. Rejoice over her heaven and you saints, apostles and prophets, because God has executed your judgment on her. And we're going to get to that. That's going to be big in, in the coming weeks. Okay? So what is the antidote for this infection? What is the antidote for this infection? Luke chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. This is the ministry of John the Baptist. Verse 10, what then should we do? The crowds were asking him. He replied to them, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. What, what can we do, right, to, to show that we have changed? What can we do to show the fruits of repentance? What can we do? If you have more than you need, share with somebody. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Don't collect any more than what you've been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, Well, what should we do? He said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. How to get rid of the infection. Renew your mind. Start to think in a different way. Now the people were waiting expectantly, verse 15, and all of them were debating in their minds whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I am. I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn up with a fire that never goes out. Then, along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. We're going to talk about next week how that could be good news. How can it be good news that somebody's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire? How can it be good news that the winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn? How do you gather wheat? You cut it down first. But the chaff he will burn up with a fire that never goes out. Might be. We're getting ready to read about the lake of fire in Revelation. Lake of fire don't go out. Gonna be people's in there. This is Vin Baker. Does he look familiar? Him alone. Vin Baker earned $100 million through his 13-year professional career. But after a long battle with alcoholism and a series of financial missteps, including a failed restaurant investment, he lost most of his fortune. It took several years to get back on track with years of rehab and becoming a minister at his father's church. But Baker says he's been sober for four years. He even credits Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz for allowing him the ability to start a new career path. For me, this could have ended most likely in jail or death. That's how these stories usually end, Baker said. For me to summon the strength to walk out here and get excited about retail management at Starbucks and try to provide for my family, 
I feel that that's more heroic than being 6'11 with a fadeaway jump shot. It's better to stand outside the house of God than to sit in the tents with the wicked. Not that playing in the NBA is wicked, but this man has had a change of his mind. You see what I'm saying? This man's mind has hmm. changed. Despite the humbling experience, Baker says he does not view his circumstances as tragic, but rather a learning opportunity and a chance to redeem himself. He's now training to manage his own Starbucks franchise. Quote, when you learn lessons in life, no matter what, no matter what level you're at financially, that's big. The important part is to realize it could happen. So in other words, the infection has nothing to do with where you are economically. Right? I was an alcoholic. I lost a fortune. I had a great talent and lost it. For the people on the outside looking in, they're like, wow, for me, I'm 43 and I have four kids. I have to pick up the pieces. I'm a father. I'm a minister in my father's church. I have to take the story and show that you can bounce back. You grab hold of the... You can't, you can't, you can't have stolen. Stolen. Repeat that, please, because you broke up a little bit. I have a hold of the treasure, treasure that you can't, can't have stolen, stolen from me. That's right. That's right. So this brother got the antidote. Okay. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see Jesus, who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. So, running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down and come, hurry and come down because today I must stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I've extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. This man heard about Jesus, had not met Jesus, had not seen Jesus, but knew that there was something that he had to be a part of. Okay? He knew. He knew that there was more to being rich more to having the accoutrements of wealth, more to life than luxury. So much so that he was willing to climb up a tree just to get a glimpse. And Jesus says, come down. I'm staying at your house today. And in the face of opposition, look, he's gone to lodge with a sinful man. Here he is completely different than the rich young ruler who did all the stuff, but his heart wasn't right. Because when Jesus said, one thing you lack, give away everything and come follow me, he said, I, ca I can't do it. And he went away sad. This dude, without being prompted, said, I will give away half and anybody that I ripped off, I'll pay them back 400%. Without being prompted, this is what he said I'm going to do. His heart had been cured of the virus. Mm -hmm. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, and the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What are the riches? Our salvation. And it's an immeasurable rich riches, right? His kindness to us in Jesus Christ is Proof of the immeasurable riches of his grace. Verse 8, for you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. The first Adam was told, by the work of your hands will you eat bread. As a result of his sin. The second Adam came and said, I am the bread of life. See the difference there? Verse 8 again, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9, Not of works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10, For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them, the antidote. Lastly, the cure for anxiety. I'm calling you again, please, Steve, the cure for anxiety. <clears throat> then he disciples, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will wear, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the raven. They don't sow. They don't have a spawn. God feeds them. Aren't you worth the birds? Can any of you add a cube to his height by wood? If then you're not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, you of little faith? Don't keep striving for what you eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious. For the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and, and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's what Ben Baker exhausted. Glad to know that. I wondered what happened.